To the general public of the 18 and early 1900s, traveling circuses, sideshows, and Wild West extravaganzas that featured a wide variety of daredevil performances, exotic animals, and gymnastic distractions provided hours of amusement and family fun for all of those who attended. With a mostly minimal entrance fee and their ability to travel to different locales rather than being location dependent, they were likely a welcome distraction for many townsfolk that had never seen such dynamic costumes, creatures, quirky characters, and of course, clowns. Carnival barkers invited people to step right up, folks, shouting, come one, come all, and beckoning many a mistrusting observer inside with the offer of winning some great prize or witnessing a once in a lifetime performance, but mostly to part with their hard earned money. Of course, the nature of fallen man being what it is such circuses tended towards featuring all manner of colorful, unusual, and outlandish acts, eventually slipping into more than just the mysterious, but ever further towards the strange and outright bizarre. There was a dark side to many of even the most prominent of these traveling shows in the popular sideshow spectacles of the day, sadly misnamed The Freak Show. These featured a wide assortment of people who mostly were the unfortunate victims of medical conditions that were largely untreatable by the experts of the day and unknown by the average layperson. These people were quite susceptible to exploitation by those who knew their vulnerability, yet provided community, care, and cash to a whole contingent of people who were otherwise largely outcast from mainstream society. Indeed, the sideshow performers often created great bonds of friendship with one another. Some even got married and had children which may not have been the case should they have never have had the opportunity of entering a more welcoming social environment. And yet, aside from the obvious ongoing humiliation of having a physical abnormality not only displayed and highlighted in public advertising, both in print and open air venues, there was an even more insidious focus that was often emphasized about these so-called sideshow freaks the common claim to them being like animals. Many sideshow performers had what was known as a pitch card, essentially a photograph or illustration of them, with a brief description about their appearance and supposed personal background, which was largely fictional for most of them. These provided a way for them to make a few extra nickels on the side and brought larger crowds through cheap advertising. A look at just a few of them reveal the often dehumanizing nature of the names given to them and the common creatures that they were compared to. The Lobster Man, Mule-Faced Woman, Spider Woman, Hop the Frog Boy, Camel Girl, Wolf Boy or Wolf Man. And of course, this was all in addition to the more well-known bearded ladies, giants, little people, and such. 
But the most negatively influential depictions of all were those used to attempt to demonstrate the connection between all people to our supposed animal ancestors, rather than the biblical understanding that we were all specially created in the image of God. Through the portrayal of many of these folks as ape-like and as specifically as evolutionary missing links. It should be noted that the promotion of so-called ape people, ape human hybrids, and so-called missing links were already gaining popularity among the more liberal and or atheistic minded of the Western intelligentsia decades before Charles Darwin published Origin of Species in 1859 which dealt almost exclusively with so-called lower animals, let alone his volume on supposed human evolution released in 1871 titled The Descent of Man. The urban legend often promoted today that Darwin discovered the story of evolution while traveling around the world because of the scientific facts that he observed is historical hogwash these naturalistic ideas had been creeping around the scientific community for a while. After all, Charles' own great-grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had written a full-blown treatise on evolution called Zoonomia in 1794 that contained most of the essential elements taught by modern-day evolutionists, albeit in a more primitive way. Darwin popularized a specific mechanism, natural selection, that could supposedly justify the concept that different kinds of creatures could be modified through an indefinite number of small changes to produce entirely different kinds of creatures with entirely new forms, functions, and features from its ancestors. Of course, that idea has been shown to be false. Natural selection only selects from genetic information already in existence. It doesn't originate never-before-seen variation. Creationists actually embrace natural selection as part of the creation model, as it accounts for the enormous variation that we see within the various kinds of creatures that God created. But evolutionists once believed it could do the heavy lifting of generating new novel variation. But that was proven false. Hence the popularization of today's neo-Darwinian theory, which attempts to include genetic mutation, essentially spelling mistakes made within DNA, as a creative mechanism for novel genetic information upon which natural selection then operates. And although Many modern evolutionists still claim this one-two punch to have been the way the biodiversity of life evolved on Earth. This, of course, has also never been observed, which means it's a faith position rather than a purely scientific one. It should be noted that natural selection is so equated with the concept of biological evolution that they're often used interchangeably both in popular level references and even in scientific literature. Keep this in mind as we explore further, but for now, back to our historical carnival ride. The popularization of these evolutionary ideas among the average person in the 1800s, who generally were churchgoers and certainly not involved in studying any kind of alleged scientific evolutionary explanations for life and humans, often came through more mundane means, such as the circuses and carnivals that were growing in popularity everywhere. Arguably, the most famous circus of all was Barnum and Bailey's, eventually touted as the greatest show on earth. Barnum had featured diseased, deformed, and diminutive individuals in exhibits for years in different venues. In fact, Barnum had the wild man of the prairies, described as the deformed but talented man-monkey Harvey Leach as far back as the 1840s. Promotional material for Leach's 1846 appearance at London's Egyptian Hall asked, Is it an animal? Is it human? Or is it the long-sought-for link between man and the orangutan, which naturalists have for years decided does exist, but which has hitherto been undiscovered? 
And this date further confirms that evolutionary stories had been promoted for decades prior to Darwin's initial book launch. However, only months after Charles Darwin published his highly influential Origin of the Species in 1859, Barnum released posters depicting another man-monkey, similarly described as looking somewhat human but with the anatomy of an orangutan, which was declared to be nothing less than the missing link. To increase the public's perception as to the validity of their claims, the circus advertised that the savage creature was a man-monkey captured while swinging from the trees in an African jungle, and had been examined by their most scientific men, and identified as a connecting link between the wild native African and the brute creation. Many of the advertisements used the demeaning, non-specific title, What Is It?, to pique the general public's curiosity while advancing the notion that there was supposed scientific evidence for the story of human evolution that one could observe right before their own eyes. Promoted as Zip the Pinhead or Zip the What Is It?, his real name was William Henry Johnson. Zip was the son of former slaves William and Mahalia Johnson and had six siblings. Far from being born in the jungles of Africa, he was actually an African American born in rural Liberty Corners, New Jersey. And far from being any kind of ape-human hybrid, he was likely the victim of the brain disorder known as microcephalicism, often called pinhead or conehead disease back then and he also had a form of dwarfism. Barnum encouraged Zip to dress in a loincloth and lean on a stick to emphasize the bipedalism he hadn't fully developed in him yet, or put on his most famous outfit, a furry monkey suit, and to grunt and screech like an animal, all to play up the missing link angle. The simple, good-natured Johnson happily went along with the charade throughout his life. So much so that according to an April 26, 1926 New York Times article reporting his death, he'd actually offered himself up as scientific evidence of a missing link during the famous so-called Scopes Monkey Trial. By the time Zip passed away from pneumonia at the age of 81, he had been used to convince millions of people that he was in fact a genuine ape man a missing link that confirmed the story of evolution as fact and the Bible's history of humanity as false. Apparently, Zip knew this was untrue, as before he died, his sister testified that he'd said, well, we fooled him a long time. Examples of so-called links between humans and their supposed animal heritage had appeared prior to Darwin's primary publications, and the cruel and racist attitudes such ideas produced took a fearful toll on some of the unfortunate people involved in the human freak show industry. For example, five years prior to Darwin's Origin of Species, Julia Pastrana was exhibited on Broadway in New York's Gothic Hall. She was originally billed as a marvelous hybrid or bear woman and noted as a semi-human being, somewhat between a human being and an orangutan by George C.D. Odell, the theater chronicler, in his diary. She was described as follows. The eyes of this Lucis Natura, in Latin literally a sport of nature, a freak, mutant, or monster, beams with intelligence, while its jaws, jagged fangs, and ears are terrifically hideous. Nearly its whole frame is coated with long, glossy hair. Its voice is harmonious, for this semi-human being is perfectly docile. Pastrana was of Mexican Indian descent and born hirsute with her entire body covered in thick black hair. Her jaws and teeth were also unusually prominent, likely due to what would be now described as severe gingival hyperplasia. 
Over the course of her career, she would be described as baboon lady, ape woman, and the ugliest woman in the world in advertisements and commentaries made for her performances, in which she sang and danced for the masses. Today, she would be described medically as suffering from polytrichosis. During this time, approximately only 50 other people were known to have Pastrana's condition, and many of them worked in circuses as ape men or human werewolves, and thus influenced hundreds of thousands of average people towards a belief in a supposed animalistic origin for not only her, but the entire history of humankind. Interestingly, the Bible describes an example of someone who seemed to have an abnormal amount of hair as well, Jacob's twin brother, Esau. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Genesis 27, verse 11. Scripture records that with his mother's help, Jacob impersonates his hairy older twin by dressing in Esau's clothes and covering his own hands and the nape of his neck with hairy goatskins. When their blind father Isaac felt the hair on Jacob's arms, he believed that Jacob was Esau. Fooled by the ruse, Isaac is tricked into giving the younger son the blessing of the firstborn. And while Esau may have simply been at the extreme end of what is considered normal male hairiness, such a specific description may indicate a scriptural example of someone already suffering some type of abnormality, such as male hirsutism or hypertrichosis. But back to Ms. Pastrana's story. The number of references demonstrating the attempt to position Pastrana as a missing link or ape-like throwback is quite prolific and high-level evolutionist scientists of the day used her condition to promote evolutionary belief. Here are just a few examples. Ernst Haeckel, infamous for his forged embryo drawings used to falsely promote evolution in textbooks for over a hundred years, described Pastrana as an ape-like human that represented a higher stage of development than the long-nosed apes in his book, The Evolution of Man. Charles Darwin himself described Pastrana as gorilla-like evidence of the assortment of genetic variation found in humans that natural selection could select from. And the overtly racist The Living Races of Mankind, which was considered a standard anthropological text in 1902, contained a photograph of Pastrana used in certain American racist publications, claiming her an example of a hybrid between a black person and an ape. And anthropologist Richard Milner, author of the Encyclopedia of Evolution, Humanity's Search for Its Origins, stated, Julia Pastrana was a throwback to an ape-like stage of humanity. Pastrana's story of exploitation is indeed a sad one that seemed to have no boundaries. Her husband and manager, Theodore Lent, arranged for performances both during her life and after her and their infant son's death, because both suffered from similar diseases. He arranged their embalming to allow their bodies to be exhibited and entice audiences whenever he could find venues that would allow it. Incredibly, the general public's appetite for such grotesque displays was not limited just to the Victorians and early 20th century parishioners, but astonishingly continued into the early 1970s. As late as 1972, Pastrana's body toured the United States with a traveling amusement park called the Million Dollar Midway. And the following summer, the bodies of mother and child were displayed across Sweden. Thereafter, their bodies were stored. The sad fact is that such dehumanizing shows continued long after any excuse that these examples of missing links were anything other than suffering people had been proven. And despite the scientific and medical community's understanding of this, Priscilla, the monkey girl, with advertising asking, was Darwin right? Did man evolve from ape? Toured the United States as recently as 1974. In fact, it wasn't until February the 7th, 2013, that Julia Pastrana was returned to Mexico and buried with proper dignity, a few days later in Sinaloa de Levra. It's entirely reasonable to assume 
that if Pastrana had been perceived as fully human, created in the image of God, and simply a victim of a sin-cursed world, she and her son's remains would never have been allowed to be displayed for profit like animals. Once his seminal work was published, popularized, and iconized within the more atheistic and anti-biblical intellects of his day, Darwin's name became associated with popular evolutionary ideas such as missing links with increasing regularity. And a well-known example is Creo Farini, a young Siamese girl who was exploited as an ape child when she was just six years old first in Europe and later in the United States. Creo apparently suffered from medical challenges similar to Julia Pastrana's, and the physical results of her medical conditions provided her promoters with everything they were looking for in an eight-man hybrid exhibit. Having appeared on the scene in the early 1880s, nine years after the descent of man's ideas had been absorbed, assimilated, and disseminated into the consciousness of Western society, Creo was literally referred to as Darwin's missing link in a self-described exhaustive research of medical literature titled Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine, published in 1896. Again. This was despite the vast awareness and understanding of such medical conditions. There was no reason except to benefit the self-serving promoters for both monetary and ideological gains to justify Creo's exploitation. In fact, Miss Farini was well-read and spoke several languages, and yet she starred in the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus until she passed away at age 49 in April 1926. As evolutionary ideas continued to grow among the scientific and lay communities, missing link exhibits in sideshows became more and more commonplace. Naturalistic ideas of man's origins were disseminated first among the scientific elite and then among the general public through such exhibits. And once popularized, they were then used by scientists as observable examples of human evolution. And this created an ideological cycle of cross-promotion that bolstered belief in more naturalistic ideas of man's origins among all strata of society in clear contradiction of the plain reading of God's Word. As distasteful and demeaning as we might conceive the exploitation of less fortunate people as animalistic sideshow freaks, this whole industry helped propagate a much more insidious belief that gained steam and became more normalized in Western society increasingly to this day. And that's the concept of scientific racism. The most egregious result from it was the eugenics movement and resultant horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides. Darwin's publications catalyzed this concept into mainstream acceptance, because many now felt that there was scientific justification for believing that some persons were less human than others, while others were superior. It provided intellectual jet fuel to the ideological concept of the supposed superiority of certain people groups over others. And many now felt that they, and for their race, were literally higher on the evolutionary ladder than some of the more primitive and less developed races. Even the American paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and historian of science, Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, admitted, Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Understand that Gould was an atheist, a Marxist, and a giant amongst naturalists. He worked at the American Museum of Natural History. A Harvard professor and one of the most influential authors of popular science of his generation, Gould was also one of the most honest evolutionists of his day, and was willing to admit that evolutionary ideas often had negative consequences. That racism increased by orders of magnitude is no overstatement. In the same year that Darwin's Descent of Man was released, Thomas Huxley, commonly called Darwin's Bulldog, described people with light skin as bigger-brained and smaller-jawed, 
and had the following to say about people with dark skin. No rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. While it's almost never mentioned in today's popular articles, movies, or school curricula, the supposed racial superiority of Caucasians was boldly described in Darwin's treatise, one that Huxley and many others fully embraced. Darwin declared, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, even than the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Although the more Victorian sounding terminology he used may sound strange to modern ears, Darwin's intermingling references to ape anthropomorphous apes, i.e. the apes that appear more human-like, baboon, gorilla, negroes, Australian aborigines, and Caucasians suggested an evolutionary hierarchy, a conclusion that Huxley and many of his contemporaries also came to, which grossly stated was that black people or negroes were less evolved than white people or Caucasians and could be seen as lesser persons. And all of this harkens back to the descriptive terminology used in the promotional material commonly used to describe the sideshow freaks that we've previously discussed. Baboon, orangutan, ape man, found swinging from the trees in Africa, man monkey, missing link, brute creation, marvelous hybrid, semi-human being, gorilla-like, between a black person and an ape, ape-like human, throwback to the ape-like stage of humanity. Sideshow ads featuring ape men with other animalistic descriptions of humans served as subtle evolutionary sermons, grooming the general public towards a more evolutionary worldview. However, after Darwin's work was published, the subtlety largely disappeared. Indeed, American literary critic Leslie Aaron Fielder concluded, such racist mythology did not play a determining role in the perception of non-Europeans by Europeans until the triumph of the theory of organic evolution in Darwin's Ascent of the Species, 1859, and its extension by analogy into early developmental anthropology. Although lacking any true observational confirmation for it, the story of supposed human evolution was quickly promoted and codified as proven science among mainstream scientific circles in the West, as an examination of popular literature published consecutively beyond this point in time confirms, and a small sampling follows. As early as 1907, Scientific American described pygmies this way. The personal appearance, characteristics, and traits of the Congo pygmies conclude they are small, ape-like, elfish creatures. Published just seven years later in 1914, the popular U.S. textbook Civic Biology presented an overtly racist depiction of mankind in a supposed evolutionary hierarchy. It identified five races of man, Ethiopian, Malay, American Indian, Mongolian, and finally, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. And in 1924, the New York Tribune featured Australian Aborigines as missing links in a top story where headlines declared, Kindred of Stone Age men discovered on Antarctic Island, missing links with mankind in early dawn of history. Such examples are too numerous to mention and can be traced throughout the rest of the 20th century. Racist ideas such as these proliferated Nazi propaganda, undergirded Jim Crow laws throughout the US, and contributed to the forced segregation initiatives in Canada through the residential school program. And while some today would say such thinking has largely passed from modern society, examples of scientific racism still commonly persist. 
News reports describing light-skinned fans with hands bunched up under their armpits, screeching monkey noises at dark-skinned soccer players, for example, are still far too commonplace. We understand that such actions are racist, but what's the real message conveyed through using monkey sounds or throwing bananas towards someone with dark skin? The answer is literally illustrated in the popular and supposedly scientific ape to man diagram seen in textbooks, t-shirts, classrooms, and coffee cups. It almost always depicts dark-skinned hairy apes turning into Caucasians, supposedly over millions of years, which provides a simple visual concept once again illustrating that the less melanin you have in your skin, the more advanced you are i.e. darker people are closer to the apes and less evolved. Therefore, white people are superior to blacks. Which is the exact same racist monkey man messaging portrayed by the crude carnival barkers of yesteryear. Again, remember the gorilla girl and man monkey references among the circus freaks that we've discussed? The entire concept of human evolution undergirds racist ideas, and Darwin, the father of modern evolution, clearly expressed those ideas from the beginning. Scientific racism is still promoted throughout all major educational institutions via the teaching of evolution, even in its modified forms, though much more under the radar today for the most part likely because of the fear of treading on the eggshells of the more politically correct segments in modern society. However, much to my home country of Canada's shame, as recently as 1997, Professor Philip Rushton from Western University produced a work called Race, Evolution and Behavior that openly rehashed these views. In Barry Mailers, a professor at Ferris State University, review of Rushton's work, he reports, Blacks, according to Rushton, have smaller brains, making them less intelligent than whites and Asians. Using 60 different measures, Rushton ranks the races along an evolutionary scale with Blacks at the bottom and Asians at the top. The fact is, these ideas have been embedded into the consciousness of Western society over not just several decades, but over hundreds of years now. And indeed, ideas have consequences. And these evolution-based ideas resulted in some of the most horrific consequences ever imagined. Some logical conclusions of the idea of evolution have had truly devastating results. And undoubtedly the most well-known is the Jewish Holocaust, the final solution carried out in Nazi Germany during World War II. Although many have not made the connection, Hitler had outlined his conclusion that social Darwinism was the basis for a successful Germany by as early as 1925 in Chapter 4 of his infamous book Mein Kampf. The whole idea that a struggle for existence between the various races of man was at work and that the fairer Aryan race was the pinnacle of evolution was the intellectual scaffolding on which his entire ideology hung. Having personally read large portions of his work, I can confirm that Hitler was a fanatical Darwinist. But this isn't just my personal biased conclusion. All manner of Nazi literature and records of their communications has been confirmed as much many times over. Researcher Robert Clark concluded that Adolf Hitler was captivated by evolutionary teaching, probably since the time he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas, quite undisguised, lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf and in his public speeches. Hitler reasoned that a higher race would always conquer a lower race. So the systematic destruction of millions of Jews was in essence simply survival of the fittest in action. Eliminating Jews and others, including dark-skinned and other lesser people, was not considered murder by the Nazis. These lesser people were deemed less human and unworthy of life, justifiably removed from the competition among the higher races. 
What many people aren't aware of is that Germany had already conducted a live test run of the genocide some 50 years earlier, all based on the same materialistic philosophy in the African country of Namibia. Although well documented, this Holocaust before the Holocaust is rarely linked to Nazism and its connected ideology, scientific racism. The brute facts are that more than 80% of the Herero population and 50% of the Nama population of Namibia were killed by German soldiers between 1904 and 1908. But their persecution began much earlier in 1884, when Germany invaded the territory and founded the German Southwest Africa colony. The Herero genocide was a systematic campaign of racial extermination that included the use of concentration camps and medical experimentation, and is considered the first genocide of the 20th century. The details of the campaign are truly horrific. Surviving female prisoners were enslaved and forced to boil down their fellow tribespeople's decapitated skulls some of whom were family and friends, and preparing them for so-called scientific study back in Germany in universities and museums. Such study involved testing skull and brain size to determine their evolutionary status. Thousands of those enslaved women were also victims of sexual violence inflicted by German soldiers. And Dr. Eugene Fischer, the ghoulish German professor of medicine, anthropology and eugenics, later a member of the Nazi party who served as director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity and Eugenics, conducted medical experiments on many of these children born from these rapes. His conclusions aren't surprising. Such biracial children were deemed inferior although they were superior to the Herero mothers because of their German father's genetic contribution. Fischer later taught his racist theories to many Nazi doctors, and one of his students was none other than Joseph Mengele, later to be known as the Angel of Death. Fischer's research inspired many, including Adolf Hitler and Mengele, who was responsible for the many horrifying medical experiments and butchery done to innocents in the Auschwitz-Birkenau camps. The question that needs to be asked is this. Why did a country that had earlier on in the century sent missionaries to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with Africans suddenly decide that Africans were subhumans worthy of extermination? A clear answer comes from John Bridgman, an American historian, professor emeritus of the University of Washington, whose in-depth examination of the Herero genocide reveals the following. The average German looks down upon the natives as being about on the same level as the higher primates, baboon being their favorite term for the natives, and treats them like animals. Again, we see the conceptual links, same level, higher primates, baboon, animals, that we see from the era of the freak shows. And remember, ideas have consequences. You see, the Namibian invasion took place only 14 short years after the release of Charles Darwin's Descent of Man, in which Darwin claimed, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races. German intelligentsia had embraced Darwin's work immediately and had quickly taken its implications, suggestions, and extrapolated them to their furthest. Man is the result of natural processes. God does not exist. And the only law is nature's law, survival of the fittest. Since many German leaders considered themselves the most fit, they decided to put these principles into practice accordingly. And in case anyone should consider what's been said here is an overreach, understand that the link to Darwin's teachings in the Namibian massacre is even more direct, especially when examining the words of the German general Lothar von Trotha, who was sent in 1904 to oversee this genocide. He stated his strategy was as follows. At the outset, we cannot do without the natives, i.e. for hard labor, but they finally have to melt away. Where the climate allows the white man to work, 
philanthropic views cannot banish Darwin's law, survival of the fittest. There's no doubt that belief in Darwin's missing links led directly to belief in Darwin's law of survival of the fittest, which states that the strong eliminate the weak or less worthy of life. Such direct connections can be further seen in later Nazi propaganda films that were used to seed the minds of the German population against the less human status of the Jewish population. Search Smoking Gun Proof Nazis Were Evolutionists on YouTube and you'll find an example of such propaganda called Victims of the Past, which says, All weak living things will perish in nature. In the last few decades, mankind has sinned frightfully against the law of natural selection. We haven't just maintained life unworthy of life, we have even allowed it to multiply. The term natural selection had only appeared in 1859, attributed to Darwin. Yet in just a short time, many groups were coming to very specific conclusions to how this process should be directly applied to human populations under evolutionary assumptions. Remember the 1914 US textbook we previously quoted from, Civic Biology? Here's a few brief snippets of its writer's conclusions under six specific categories, the same conclusions which drove the eugenics movement. Evolution of man. Undoubtedly, there once lived upon the earth races of men who were much lower in their mental organization than the present inhabitants. The beginnings of civilization were long ago, but even today, the earth is not entirely civilized. The races of man. At the present time, there exists upon the earth five races or varieties of man. The highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Improvement of man. If the stock of domesticated animals can be improved, is it not unfair to ask if the health and vigor of the future generations of men and women on the earth might not be improved by applying them to laws of selection? Eugenics. When people marry, there are certain things that the individual as well as the race should demand. Feeble-mindedness are handicaps which it is not only unfair but criminal to hand down to posterity. The science of being well-born is called eugenics. Parasitism and its cost to society. Hundreds of families such as those described above exist today, spreading disease, immorality and crime to all parts of this country. They take from society, but they give nothing in return. They are true parasites. The remedy. If such people were lower animals, we would probably kill them off to prevent them from spreading. Humanity will not allow this, but we do have the remedy of separating the sexes in asylums or other places and in various ways preventing intermarriage and the possibilities of perpetuating such a low and degenerate race. Remedies of this sort have been tried successfully in Europe and are now meeting with some success in this country. If such people were lower animals is a key phrase here. It's what unlocked the genie of genocide that's caused untold misery and death around the world. All someone has to do in order to scientifically, intellectually and ethically justify murder is to dehumanize a person to the status of a lower animal, and anything goes. Under that mindset, you can justify enslavement, rape, torture and extermination of whatever target group that you deem unworthy of life. Just ask the abortionists, the serial killers of the day who operate with impunity because of the declassification of millions of innocent babies as being falsely declared not truly human. And just like the story of evolution itself, it perseveres with absolutely no real scientific justification whatsoever. From its inception, the scientific proofs offered to support human evolution have been riddled with holes. In fact, just like the dubious sideshow examples touted by circus shysters, 
Many of the earliest proofs were fraudulent. And modern research shows that many proofs were driven by scientific ignorance and evolutionary interpretations rather than solid evidence. However, the Bible is clear that many people attempt to deny the God of Scripture because of their unrighteousness, as a way to avoid personal judgment for their sin. In essence, many are willing to believe a lie rather than the truth if it suits their purpose. They become compliant with error and are willing to be deceived. Perhaps it's like the saying often attributed to P.T. Barnum says, there's a sucker born every minute. Take Neanderthals, for example. In 1856, workmen digging in a cave in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf in Germany discovered a fossilized skull cap, two femurs, and bone fragments. Examined by one Professor Schaffhausen, a professional anatomist, he concluded that they were fully human. However, four years later, after the release of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, the search for fossils of imagined ape-like ancestors of man increased with much vigor amongst naturalists. And lo and behold, Irish geologist William King decided to re-examine the fossil skull of Neanderthal man and see what he thought. His conclusion? Like other Darwinians of the day, he argued, against the professional opinion of an expert anatomist, that Neanderthal man was an ape-like creature. And so positive was he that he actually declared, the thoughts and desires which once dwelt within it never soared beyond those of the brute. Such clairvoyant ability as to somehow perceive the fossilized thoughts emanating from a collection of bones demonstrates his obvious evolutionary bias. And this wild speculation wasn't simply against the opinion of one lone expert from across the aisle of human origin ideology. It flew in the face of no other than the great anatomist Rudolf Virchow, one of the most prominent physicians of the 19th century, who also argued that Neanderthals were fully human in every respect, with any abnormalities being the result of their suffering from rickets or arthritis. However, Depictions of Neanderthals as stooped over ape men began to proliferate evolutionary literature, and such representations were mimicked in the circuses and carnival freak shows of the day. The evolutionary mindset took hold of all sectors of society, becoming the evolutionary memes of their day. For example, in 1929, life-sized statues of bestial Neanderthals greeted visitors viewing Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History and were only replaced relatively recently. After an overwhelming amount of evidence collected over the years proved that Neanderthals were simply powerfully built people, well within the modern range of human anatomy, they were replaced with more modern depictions, which today look like normal humans. A current Chicago Field Museum article states, the first of two Neanderthal family dioramas were installed in 1929. In the early 1970s, the Neanderthal figures were replaced with new ones. By 1994, the Hall of the Stone Age of the Old World exhibit had been dismantled because most were considered to be scientifically inaccurate. The Hall had included the Neanderthal family. So, despite their still being used as examples of our supposed primitive ancestors in popular movies and catchy commercials such as the Simple Enough for a Caveman to Do It series today, Neanderthals were never subhuman. That idea was always a false imposition applied upon the facts rather than derived directly from them. And perhaps the most definitive confirmation of this comes from no less than Dr. Eric Trinkhaus a paleoanthropologist specializing in Neanderthals, early modern human biology, and human evolution. He's considered one of the world's foremost authorities on Neanderthal man, and he has concluded, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there's nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. So, evolutionists used Neanderthals for approximately 175 years to lace the minds of millions with evolutionary ideas of proto-human derivatives, only to later affirm their full humanity. 
But what about other examples that have been offered to the public? The most famous hoax, and one that is much bemoaned among the evolutionary community, is the famous Piltdown Man. The supposed ape man skull and jawbone was found in 1912 by a laborer digging in a gravel pit near the town of Piltdown in England. It was announced that both pieces came from the same ancient ape man and dubbed Piltdown Man. For 40 years, this supposed proof of human evolution was displayed in museum exhibits and textbooks as proof positive that human beings had descended from ape-like ancestors with hand-drawn, supposed scientific images of what the creature must have looked like, all with amazing similarity to how the freak show Missing Links were portrayed, described, and depicted by their promotional artists as well. Only after four decades was the evidence re-examined and revealed as a fraud. And it wasn't even a good fraud, as one could easily see how the teeth from the jawbone had been filed down to make them look more human and the bones had been chemically treated to make them look very old. It was simply a combination of an old human skull and a modern ape jawbone stuck together. We raise this example today not simply to rub it in that one evidence for evolution has been disproven, but to point out that the acceptance and promotion of such evidence by professionals for over 40 years can only be attributed to one of two things. Pathetic scientific acumen displayed by the evolutionary scientists of the day, or an agenda that made people willing to overlook the obvious fraud to accomplish its ideologic goals. For hundreds of people involved in producing museum-grade copies of the exhibit, distributing them to various museums around the world, and producing numerous textbook diagrams and descriptions based on the evidence all not to detect the fraud seems highly suspicious or perhaps negligent at best. Now, just five years later, a Nebraskan rancher found what he thought was a special kind of tooth on his farm. And an evolutionist paleontologist friend of his was excited at the prospect that it might be from an ape man. Once again, an artist with a healthy helping of evolutionary imagination produced a portrait of Nebraska man a hairy ape man, along with his ape woman wife, complete with an ape woman bob cut, apparently to make her appear feminine, but not too feminine. Several years later, scientists confirmed that the tooth had come from a type of pig. The whole fiasco had nothing to do with apes or people. It had everything to do with evolutionary presuppositions that drove false conclusions, all based on laughably flimsy evidence. Much as how the carnivals cycled through the unfortunate ape men performers of the past, a whole slew of proposed human ancestors have come and gone over the years as a carousel of caveman candidates have been proposed, debunked, reassigned, or removed from the forefront of human evolutionary thought. Cro-Magnon, Peking Man, Java Man, Ramapithecus, all of these were once shouted from the proverbial rooftops in both popular news articles and serious scientific publications as proof of evolution, only to later lose favor among the more progressive evolutionary community. Currently popular candidates such as Homo erectus are not faring much better under scrutiny. Although smaller than the average human is today, the brain size is within the range of modern people and studies of the middle ear have shown that Homo erectus walked just as we do. There's nothing about their skeletons that fall outside of the normal human range, and their remains have been found in the same strata near ordinary Homo sapiens, clear evidence that they live together. Given the range of heights, sizes, and features that we see among the fully human race today, they're not exactly anything to write your evolutionary thesis about. However, there's still one very popular contender often discussed, the famous fossil find called Lucy. Australopithecus afarensis, popularly known as Lucy, is still the most well-known modern example of supposed human evolution today. She was once much touted as our supposed ancestor and uniquely named because of the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It was playing when she was assembled by the team that found her in Ethiopia. 
However, her star has faded. For example, one of the main reasons evolutionists suggest that Lucy walked on two feet instead of all fours like the ape she resembles is that she was found near a set of fossilized human-looking footprints in a rock layer that they believed had formed at the time Lucy lived, but dated as older than human existence. They then concluded that these footprints must have come from Lucy's kind, and museum reconstruction gave her human-looking feet. However, they later found such tracks a full 932 miles, nearly 1,500 kilometers, away from Lucy's bones in Tanzania. A far better explanation is that their evolutionary assumptions are just wrong, and that they're simply a set of human footprints that have nothing to do with the cobbled together group of bones called Lucy, that aren't necessarily even collected from the same creature. You see, many laypersons likely imagine that specimens like Lucy were found in a heap and carefully retrieved as a somewhat articulated skeleton that clearly shows these ape-like hominids in similar form to how their reconstructions are shown in books and museum replicas. However, her skeleton is only 40% complete. A 2015 New Scientist article reported, a careful look at the ancient hominin skeleton suggests that one bone may actually belong to a baboon. Now, statues portraying Lucy in museums to this day display her walking upright with human-like hands and feet. However, when Lucy was found, she didn't have hands, just three left hand bones that were incomplete and not human-like, or feet whatsoever. These depictions were assumed based off of the footprints found 1,500 kilometers away, with no other physical evidence whatsoever. And scientists have since found other, more complete skeletons of such australopithecines, which do include hand and feet bones. And from them, we can make a safe guess that Lucy's hands had long, curved fingers, suited for climbing in trees, and that Lucy's feet had opposable toes seen in the hand-like feet of apes that could easily grab and climb. She didn't have human-like feet. Detailed studies of the inner ears, skulls, and bones suggest that Lucy and her like were not in fact transitioning to human anytime soon. They may have walked more upright than most apes, but not like humans. Once all of the evolutionary ideologies and interpretations are stripped away, Australopithecus afarensis is very similar to a pygmy chimpanzee. A key to understanding all of this can be found in one of the more famous attractions of the Pickards Museum, Trongate, circa 1908, in the character that was known as Solomon the Man Monkey. In a reversal of the typical Missing Link sideshow attractions, Solomon was an actual chimpanzee dressed up in men's Victorian finery and allowed to wander around. People were amused at the absurdity of seeing an ape aping a man, and he too was touted as Darwin's missing link. In essence, these examples demonstrate both ends of the spectrum of man's attempts to provide evidence for human evolution. Naturalists have looked for the most human-looking ape fossils they can find, or conversely, the most ape-like human fossils possible. However, as Kipling said, oh, east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. The fact is that Darwin's missing links are still missing because they never existed. Men were specially created in the image of God. Sadly, belief in deceptive evolutionary ideas have led many people to conclude that the God of the Bible doesn't exist, much to the detriment of mankind. For many people like myself growing up, the story of evolution removed even the idea of God from the equation of life. Like others, I once concluded that if there was a naturalistic, scientific way to account for the universe and everything in it, then God was irrelevant. And this atheistic mindset has led millions down a dark road. The conclusion that God is not needed was summed up well in the 2004 
Australian Broadcasting Corporation series called Testing God. The episode, Killing the Creator, states, But why have we turned out the way we are? Once we believed we were unique, blessed with a soul and lovingly created by God in His image. Today, evolution says we're just a product of natural selection, the descendants of primitive bacteria, not the children of God. Clearly, for many people, natural selection under an evolutionary mindset has been given God-like attributes as our creator, and quite possibly as the arbiter of our ethics and morality as well. Natural selection then replaces God and changes our ethics and morality also. Just think it through. Carried to its logical end, the solution to an overabundance of bacteria is to wipe them out. And we've seen this solution applied generously throughout the 20th century. Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Pol Pot, Hitler, all of these leaders embraced evolutionary ideas and applied social Darwinism to their populations, culling millions of their own people whom they deemed inferior and expendable. Such a mindset has even slipped down into the consciousness of many of our children. Eric Harris, one of the perpetrators of the Columbine school massacre said, Sometime in April, me and V, that's Dylan Klebold, will get revenge and will kick natural selection up a few notches. This ideology was reiterated by another high school shooter, Pekka Eric Avenin, in a YouTube video rant that he posted before his rampage. I am a cynical existentialist, anti-human humanist, anti-social social Darwinist, realistic idealist, and godlike atheist. Life is just a coincidence, result of a long process of evolution. Human life is not sacred. Humans are just a species among other animals. Death is not a tragedy. Not all human lives are important or worth saving. Social Darwinism, consistently applied, has been detrimental to society on many levels. Even arch-atheist and staunch evolutionist Dr. Richard Dawkins has said as much, declaring, I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to science, when it comes to explaining the world, but I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality and politics. Now, why would he say this? Well, obviously, as a highly educated individual, Dawkins is informed about and recognizes the negative effects of applying social Darwinism to a society. However, like many moral relativists, it seems Dawkins would like Christian morality piled on top of his materialistic cake. But the question that must be asked is, can the biblical mandate to do unto others and love thy neighbor be logically applied if the story of evolution is true and God is just a myth? If certain people groups are more advanced than others and God's moral law need not apply, under what logical premise can evolutionists argue for or against morality? If thou shalt not kill applies to humans, the question now becomes, how human? And if we're simply evolved animals, how does morality apply at all? I've never heard anyone accuse a great white shark of being evil or a snake being a serial killer. Such terms apply only to humans. Unfortunately, belief in evolution has crept into the Christian church over the last century as well. And most Christian seminaries and Bible colleges today accept large parts of the evolutionary story while some have outright declared themselves theistic evolutionists, i.e. God used evolution to create. Such compromise has caused much damage to the gospel message, as atheists have highlighted the inconsistency of such an approach. An example comes from Frank Zindler in a debate against Christian William Lane Craig, who himself now accepts theistic evolution. The most devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there is no need of a savior. And I submit 
That puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. Believers can rightly deem Zindler's conclusions as blasphemous, but certainly not illogical from his atheistic vantage point. After all, if the first Adam never existed, why do we need a last Adam? Why did the Apostle Paul teach the concept of death in Adam, but life in Christ in Romans 5.12? Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Can Christians rightly reconcile the loving God of the Bible as using billions of years of death and disease and struggle for survival in an evolutionary scenario, culminating in a process where ape-like creatures eventually morphed into humans who are somehow created in the image of God? Wouldn't that mean that God had used all of the results of Adam's sin, death and suffering, as his creative method before Adam even existed? metaphorically or not? Wouldn't that violate the Holy Scriptures, let alone necessitate disregarding the first 11 chapters of the Bible, the seedbed of all Christian doctrines, or consider it as mythology? As the Darwin historian and Bible skeptic Peter Bowler rightly concluded, if Christians accepted that humanity was the product of evolution, even assuming the process could have been seen as the expression of the Creator's will, then the whole idea of original sin would have to be reinterpreted. Far from falling from an original state of grace in the Garden of Eden, we have risen gradually from our animal origins. And if there was no sin from which we needed salvation, what was the purpose of Christ's agony on the cross? How can Christian laypeople not see how damaging it is to syncretize Christian theology with evolution, while atheists can understand and communicate it so succinctly? And yet, professing Christian influencers such as Ian Barber, who is the winner of numerous accolades in science and faith, including the 1999 Templeton Award, have proposed adopting the same theological outlook as non-believers. You simply can't say any longer, as traditional Christians, that death was God's punishment for sin. Death was around long before human beings. Death is a necessary aspect of an evolutionary world. One generation has to die for new generations to come into being. In a way, it's more satisfying than to see it as a sort of arbitrary punishment that God imposed on our primeval paradise. It's as atheist William Provine once commented, one can have a religious view that's compatible with evolution, only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. Unfortunately, a large swath of the Christian church has become similar to the circus sideshows of the past, exhibiting a depiction of the human race that's a caricature of its true biblical description. An entertaining spectacle featuring a sort of ape-man, human hybrid, clothed in quasi-religious trappings perhaps, but one that doesn't accurately reflect either the first or the last Adam's true purpose. All is the result of imbibing humanistic evolutionary philosophies instead of holding fast to the authority of God's Word from the very first verse. Many people struggle to trust the Bible because of the constant reinforcement of evolutionary ideas through modern education, catchy news articles, and popular entertainment. Reminiscent of the bygone days when sideshow storytellers flogged tales of lycanthropes and lion man and missing links, many of today's journalists won't miss a chance to give an evolutionary shout out or spin to a story. For example, a pop science news article titled Scientists Move Closer to Finding Werewolf Gene describes a family in Mexico with hair all over their face, similar to Julia Pastrana, Creo Farini, and others with similar conditions who were exploited as animal-human hybrids in the past. Though they acknowledge that this Mexican family's condition is the result of a mutated gene, they also referred to it as a leftover trait from our alleged ape ancestry. In the article's own words, the werewolf condition 
comes from an aberrant gene that runs through their large family, perhaps after reawakening from a long sleep during human evolution. Just like the carny hucksters of yesteryear, this intellectual sleight of hand slips evolutionary interpretations among observational fact, despite genetic mutations leading to dysfunction, not evolution. The mutation changed the family's amount of hairiness by damaging the genes controlling hair growth and distribution. Evolutionists' disregard for the Bible's history and sanctity of life has been devastating. Racist ideology, lack of compassion for the elderly, infirm and unborn, all considered less fit and dissolution of traditional marriage, family, and human identity all result from an evolutionary interpretation of human anthropology. Like Dr. Jekyll's counterpart, Mr. Hyde, humanity has grown comfortable seeing mankind as a civilized animal with bestial roots that resurface far too frequently. Popular portrayals of werewolves and man-beasts were cinematized with the release of Universal Pictures' The Wolfman in 1941, starring the iconic Lon Chaney and Bela Lugosi. But the term lycanthrope, a synonym for werewolf, originated in Greek mythology. Zeus punished the cruel tyrant Lycaon with a werewolf curse. Modern psychiatrists classify clinical lycanthropy as a rare form of schizophrenia, which causes victims to alter their behavior in accordance with their delusion. But of course, they don't actually suffer the physical manifestations of looking like a wolf or any other animal. And modern medicine has recorded people who sincerely thought that they'd become animals. Daniel 4 records how the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell under a similar delusion because of God's judgment on his pride. Nebuchadnezzar suffered what we might today call a mental breakdown. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Daniel 4 verses 31 to 33. Although more like a cow than a wolf, he behaved like an animal for quite some time before he came to his senses and declared, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Daniel 4, verse 37. So the moral is this, whether by divine judgment, a medical malady, or manipulation of men, people who are convinced that they are nothing but animals tend to act as such and treat others accordingly. Our world desperately needs to understand that all human life is precious, specially created by God. Scripture records a fascinating political skirmish between Jesus and the Jewish lawyers of his day, who had concocted a plot designed to force him into a no-win scenario of public disrepute, either through illegal activity or cultural betrayal. Typical of all men's attempts to struggle against God, it didn't exactly go well for them. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, and they sent their disciples to him, along with their Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Matthew 6, verses 15 to 22. Christ's question speaks volumes on the importance of the human image. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 27. One man, Adam, 
Only the descendants of Adam can be saved by their kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Physical appearance isn't a factor. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. There's only one race, the human race. There's no reason for anyone to think of someone else as worth less than another person. For God himself shows no partiality. Everyone, regardless of physical appearance, intelligence, or status among men, bear the image of God. Zip, Julia Pastrana, Creo Farini, the Herrero, Neanderthals, the Nazis, me and you. All people are image bearers and as such have inherent value and worth, not because of their own goodness or merit, but because of the one who made them all. And we should all render unto God the things that are God's. However, all of us have suffered under the same burden, the crushing weight of our sin that separates us from our Creator. And that sin came into the world when our first father, Adam, rebelled against God. In Adam, we all willingly sin as well, violating God's righteous law. And we did not render to God the glory that he deserves. We've lied, stolen, blasphemed God's name, cursed mothers and fathers, coveted, lusted, and in some cases mistreated and murdered. We've not reflected the goodness of the one who gave us life and breath, and we can never understand the suffering Christ endured on our behalf to provide our salvation. Jesus willingly suffered more indignity, shame, and physical abuse than any sideshow performer ever has. The Roman soldiers beat him, clubbed him with a wooden staff, tore out his beard, flogged him with a jagged whip, punctured his skull with a crown of thorns, and crucified him on a cross. The Messiah was literally beaten beyond human recognition, dehumanized into a freak show that horrified those who beheld him. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Isaiah 52 verse 14. But three days later, he rose from the grave in a glorified body, triumphant over sin and death. His victory is why Christians have the blessed hope that no matter what happens to us in this life, we will someday share in his resurrection. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20. The most important consideration for any person on Judgment Day is this. Do we bear Adam's marred visage, standing guilty before God by breaking the moral law that he's written on our hearts? Or do we stand clothed in the imputed righteousness of Christ, bearing the image of the last Adam, who's paid the penalty of sin and death for those who trusted in him as Savior?